Okay, welcome back everybody. So the next session is a panel, which will allow us to kind of talk about the perspectives of different players in the RDM landscape. Um, so we have three panelists. I'm very pleased to introduce Alex Clark, who is the Associate Vice President Research at the University of Alberta, and he's also a professor in the Faculty of Nursing. Alex is the co-chair of U of A's Institutional Research Data Management Strategies Working Group. Jeff Moon is a man who needs no further introduction, I think, the Executive Director at Portage. Not executive director. He's a man of the people. And Mark Leggett, who is the executive director at Research Data Canada, which is currently the uh, RDM arm of Canary that, among other things, funds software development. So different organizations, different perspectives, and we're going to hear from each of them um, a little bit about what their organization is doing in the research data management landscape. Um, so the format is that each panelist will talk for up to seven minutes. I'm leaving it up to them how much they want to say up top. Um, and after that, we're going to have a Q&A session. So please pop your questions into Menti as you think of them. We are getting kind of a store of questions, so I think we're going to have a really good discussion. But when you put your questions into Menti, it gives your colleagues an opportunity to upvote them if they think that's something they really want to hear about. So I really encourage you to to put them in that way as well. Um, and I think that's really all I need to say to you. Everybody can hear okay? Okay, great, thanks very much. All right, Alex. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, and for the committee organizing the conference, uh, it's a real privilege to be here and I thank you for the invitation. And I also thank each and every one of you here. Um, kudos to you, uh, commend you, and thank you for the work that you're doing, that you're leading and driving across this country, drawing on networks that cross the globe to bring a future around RDM that I think is really humbling. I think it's so exciting and gives me so much hope for the future. Um, and I say this uh, as a university administrator, um, so I do see the big picture at the university. I'm gonna share a little <laughs> bit about what we're doing at the university and a little bit about the basis upon which we're doing that as well. Also gonna to touch upon some of my experience um, as a scientific uh, leader, um, as a chair of peer review panels and a deputy chair of scientific officer at CHR and Heart and Stroke for about the last decade. And I'm also gonna share a little bit on the basis of the lens and the research side of it, so that the change that we're thinking about, the change that we're doing at the University of Alberta, you can see some of the research that's underpinning it. My own background informs this, so I'm like a cultural researcher, a complexity theorist, and I also do research into Canada's historical biggest cause of death and disability. Now, does anyone have any idea what Canada's biggest cause of death and disability historically is? Just shout out. Alcohol. Snowshot. Heart disease. Okay, so it's heart disease. So heart disease affects one in five Canadians. And someone with heart disease dies in Canada once every five minutes. So that'd be three people since the start of this session. Heart disease is everybody's business and your lifetime risk, men and women here, of heart disease is exactly the same. And women, you're 10 times more likely to die of heart disease based on the epidemiology than of breast cancer. When I was starting out as a researcher in heart disease and my PhD study, I would interview people shortly after they'd had a heart attack, one of the acute events, all the way through to um, three months after they'd had their heart attack. And when I used to see them in the coronary care unit, just 24 hours after they admitted, they'd be like, why is the sheep fearful that they were gonna die? And they would say, well, that's me, I'm stopping the smoking. Um, I'm gonna be exercising, this is a life change for me. And when I went to see them one week later in their house, and then one month later in their house, and then three months later in their house, you saw a gradual progression back to the patterns that they exhibited before, and back to the patterns that contributed to their heart disease. All eminently avoidable. But that's the power of context. That's the power of norms, because change is not about knowledge, change is about norms. And if you look at research into drink driving, you look at research into racism, 
You look at recession to sexism, what drives change? And the changes that we all see in our societies over years and decades, it's not really laws and regulations. It's not really sanctions. It's the power of social norms. And moving the needle around change on those norms is what drives. This change is not about seismic shifts. It's about small shifts. And this change really does take a village. It takes lots and lots of people acting together to move those norms. And we've taken a very much a collaborative approach at the University of Alberta to changing our norms around research and data management. It requires champions at the highest level like the VPR, the AVP like me. It requires champions more administratively in faculties like deans and associate deans. It takes administrators. It requires champions from the right kinds of journals and the right kinds of publishers, from funders, and ultimately researchers as well. If we are going to facilitate these changes around research and data management, it does really take a village. That can be quite intimidating because we think, oh, it's like a mountain. But having seen the changes at CHR over the years, we've done this already around knowledge translation. That's been normalized. We are doing it just now around sex and gender. In future, we're going to be doing it around equity, diversity, inclusion, and research impact. So change is the norm. And when we're thinking about changing RDM, we're following similar paths, paths that show success as other kinds of changes that have historically been precedent. How we approach this at the University of Alberta? Well, the ethos, first of all, has been very much about collaboration. It's about bringing people together who haven't normally worked together necessarily and building relationships, building trust, sharing the challenges and moving forward together. It's about thinking really, really strategically about how we frame things, how we act, and how we nudge. Not about sanctions, but about supports. It's about, if I might say, not just about carrots, but bigger carrots. <laughs> thinking about how we can frame and make this friendly and bring along some of the requirements with an ethos that's about supporting the researchers time and time again. Thinking very carefully about researchers in different segments. And you'll know if you work in universities perhaps who those segments are. How you're going to have to be different in your approach for early career researchers. You're going to have to be different in your approach to researchers who are more technophile and technophobe. And you're going to have to be different in your researchers, obviously, in relation to their disciplinary norms. And finally, thinking about how, based on research evidence, we're best to approach this. Hands up those of you who have heard of the growth mindset. Oh, wonderful. Growth mindset, research-based evidence that suggests it's not about your talent. It's not about proving how good you are at making change that's important. It's about improving how good you are at making change. And this means dealing with success and failure the same. We always try to learn. We approach every task with a sense of we're going to be strategic and savvy, but we must put learning first. And when opportunities come up to learn, not only from what works, but also what doesn't, to do so openly. To do so not defensively, but to recognize this is the path if we really care about success that we'll take. Paradoxically, not putting success first, but putting at every turn the learning first. So finally, I'll end up, how will we know if we've made change? And the reality is in the short term, you will see apathy move to worry and hostility. And that's encouraging because it means people are starting to care and they have a sense of doing nothing is not an option. Secondly, recognizing the real power here is in small shifts. Whole research body of evidence around marginal gains. We don't want seismic shifts. We want small shifts in many, many things. And research suggests if you want success, that's the best way to approach this endeavor. And finally, to end as we started, the best approach is ultimately about together. It's about community. It's about each and every one of us here. And I look forward on behalf of all our administrators in our universities in supporting this change. Thank you. Thanks so much, Alex. I'm asking people to come to the podium because the mic for the recording is at the podium, so that makes it a little bit easier. Well, I didn't come with the same mind map as uh, Alex did. Um, and nor did I come with the 
charming Scottish brogue. So <laughs> here we are. Um, I'm not going to take very long. I've already had my say. Um, I will say that in the context of, of my thinking on this, every one of you here, and every one of you here is diverse and comes from a different background. How many of you are the library folks? Okay. How many of you are not affiliated with the library? Okay. So it's about a two-thirds, one-third, three-quarters, one-quarter. But if you're here from an ethics board, if you're here from IT, if you're here from uh, administration, you are just as important, if not more important, than the, the vast hordes from the library world who will do this whether you whether you approve of it or not. We'll just keep doing it. But the fact that we've got you here with us today means that the work that we're doing in the library world is going to be so much uh, richer, so much more successful, so much more productive in the context of all of these enterprises that I had the opportunity to share with you earlier. So I just wanted to say thank you for your uh, engagement here. And over the next uh, day and a half, we're going to be listening more to you, I hope, than you listening to, to us. And I will pass the mic over to, to Mark now. That was clear. It was clear. <laughs> All right. Uh, nice to be here. Sorry I missed this morning. I was uh, out on a few calls. I thought what I would do today is uh, tell two quick stories and then with that as a context provide some examples of what I think are the, the key things to do in the data curation context or community and then I'll throw out a couple of provocations just to spice it up a bit before we get to questions. Um, so I've had a few, some of you, um, I've known some of you for many years. I've had a couple of uh, lives. One was uh, as a university librarian at the University of PEI, and one was uh, CEO of a company that provided services around a software framework. And in that latter context, uh, one of the projects we worked on was to facilitate an effort at the Smithsonian to um, curate and preserve the 40 years of outputs from one of the world's top climate researchers who had recently retired from the Smithsonian and had this huge treasure trove of, of uh, research data under the desk, on top of the desk, beside the desk. Um, and uh, as you can imagine, 40 years of climate change data, there were a lot of different file formats. Some of them couldn't be opened. Uh, some of them they didn't even know what they were and uh, could no longer really tell because the the file extension was not very helpful and they couldn't open the documents with, with any of the standard uh, tools. So they estimated that it was going to take approximately 10 years to curate and preserve the outputs of one researcher from one institution. And uh, they were desperately trying to find software uh, tools that would help them uh, in that effort. So clearly a very complicated context which many of you here that work in data curation would be familiar with when you get a or in university archives uh, some somebody retires brings you their hard drive and asks if you could preserve and put it into the university records uh, tough task the other story kind of similar but with a different um, challenge uh, was a one of the long-standing uh, veterinary researchers at the university of pei UPEI has a veterinary science uh, program, and he used a lot of very rich images in his teaching uh, and uh, became somewhat renowned internationally as the go-to person to get a picture on a certain aspect of uh, veterinary science. Not always the best image collection to, to browse through either. So when he retired, of course, uh, his primary interest was, I need to preserve this content. Uh, went to the library. The library said, sure, we'd be happy to do it. Long term, we'll have some cost. We went to the uh, department and they said, we don't have an interest in the content being preserved. So here was an example of a researcher who was respected in their community, uh, but the long-term preservation of that collection, which required some financial support in order to do that, uh, was not available. Uh, and the institution had no specific policy for the preservation of research data for retiring uh, faculty. So another kind of challenging uh, issue in, the, uh, in this whole context. 
So over the years, with those uh, those as two um, two examples, um, I've I've worked in various aspects of the data curation context. Currently, I'm as uh, Lisa said, executive director of Research Data Canada, and I help uh, by managing Canary's research data management funding program. So both a facilitator of conversations around best practices and uh, funding. Uh, so some of the things that occurred to me that would be critical, and part of this was based on a comment that was made yesterday in one of the breakout sessions, um, that for me, digital curation belongs throughout the research life cycle. Uh, ideally, at the very beginning is where the focus is, rather than now, as those two stories illustrate, at the end of a researcher's career or at the end of a research project when they bring it to the library and ask the, the team at the library to, to go through that painful process. So for me, the key way to do that is to take an embedded approach. So for me, data curation uh, would be most effective with the data curation folks, librarians and others embedded in that research uh, ecosystem. And to me, that means you're actually part of the research team from the point at which the PI submits a proposal uh, to the point at which uh, publications are made. It'll take a while to get there. Who was it who, does somebody remember standing up here and mentioning embedded? Ah, it was, yeah. So what was the context again? Yeah. So I refer to that as the librarian mojo being inserted into the research team. But the concept of embedded librarianship, just speaking to the two-thirds of the group, uh, when I was a university librarian uh, in two institutions, was not a very popular context. Uh, it takes librarians out of the comfort zone of the traditional kind of library workflow and inserts them into the biology department or nursing department or whatever. So it is um, something that is, is going to require substantial time and effort. Uh, the second one, uh, from my perspective, is that uh, best practices, which are critical to good data curation, where data curation becomes kind of the norm and something you don't think about, has to be embedded in the domains, hence the embedded uh, librarian approach. And uh, Roger Schoenfeld had a great uh, post, I think it just came out on Friday, from the uh, Scholarly Kitchen. And one of the uh, phrases from his uh, piece, which is on research data, uh, two kind of current approaches to research data management and the deposit of data in a scholarly context. And he said, in a, in a data community, which I would uh, interpret as community of practice or a domain, the shared interest of the community provides implicitly for curation. So there again is this concept of the, the researchers within the domain and their day-to-day -day practice uh, in, when enhanced with the mojo of data curators and librarians naturally leads to strong data curation. Uh, the third point is that for me tools, software typically, uh, uh, tools development is uh, and the automation of data curation as much as uh, anathema to many people here as that might sound, I think is critical to affecting a, a better uh, picture in this uh, in this community over time. Has anybody ever heard of a project called PAR? P A R. Uh, Preservation Access Registries. Anybody here use Archivematica? Or heard of Archivematica? So Archivematica is a tool that archivists use to preserve digital data that uses something called a format policy registry as a way when you when you upload a data file it says oh this is a TIFF this is the preservation format and here are command lines that can be used to do transformations that kind of thing so PAR is an attempt uh, fund initially funded by JISC I think uh, last year to generalize the Archivematica format policy registry which has an equivalent with Preservica, which is a commercial equivalent, uh, but it, uh, it's a demonstration of the challenge we get with the siloization of our research infrastructure. So if you haven't heard of the Preservation Access Registries, I would look it up. To my mind, that is a critical component of automating 
the data curation workflow because that provides a service that sits out in the ether and listens for a ping that says, oh, this file was just deposited. Here are the preservation actions that can be taken. Here are the data analysis actions that can be taken. In other words, actions throughout the research lifecycle. To my mind, that's the most important piece of technology emerging from our research infrastructure efforts. And then, so finally, stemming from all that, a couple of restatements or provocations. Um, digital curation must be embedded in domains uh, for it to be truly effective. Uh, digital creation challenges will only be solved with automation. Um, and what I would, what was called the Preservation Access Registry to me should be renamed as DOOR or Digital Object Acc Action Registry because it's not only about preservation but all kinds of other things. So if you want to use DOOR in a funding proposal or something, go ahead, just make sure you, uh, you point it back to me. And that's it. Okay, great. Thanks very much. It's really interesting to hear each of your perspectives as uh, people representing research organizations, software development, and uh, researchers as well. So um, this is the time that you can ask all of your burning questions about research data management in Canada to three extremely qualified experts at the front of the room. And we do have some um, we do have some questions on screen, so I'm going to start going through some of those. Um, but put your hand up if you have a question that is too long and complicated to be typed into the box. I know I have at least one of those, so um, I'll be scanning the room as well. So uh, the first question, and I invite you to expand on the questions if you want to talk about something that's related but not completely on topic. Uh, the role of domain repositories versus national and institutional repositories, and we heard Mark say in one of his provocations that um, really, RDM needs to happen in the domains, and so um, does that? Do repositories have to be in the domains as well, or is that? Um, you, could you have national repositories that are not domain specific, but other kinds of domain specific software happening in the research environment? So I think Mark, because it, it works, I'm going to throw that question to you first. But I'm going to give everyone a chance to uh, to answer. Should we come back here when we answer? I, uh, yes, I'm getting the nod, yes. Uh -huh. um, so it's a great first question, a, a pet um, topic of mine. The, the current uh, RDM funding call too is focused around uh, national data services and everybody always has a challenge getting a, a sense of what it means to be a national data service. Uh, so for me, the, the two kinds of domain repositories versus institutional slash national refer to different use cases. So to my mind, an institutional repository is exactly that. It's a system that reflects institutional academic scholarly output. And sometimes it is, is put in the context of the experts directory, where you go and you search for somebody at University X that has expertise in um, healthcare regarding to um, uh, heart, uh, health, um, and you get a list of people, you click on their name, you see publications, you see their background and all that kind of stuff. Um, so a lot of people implement institutional repositories or have in the past to uh, provide access to the scholarly output of their institution and to preserve that information because libraries have a mandate to preserve often, not always, uh, the institutional memory of the institution in which they're based. Uh, a domain repository has a different use case. It's to reflect uh, the research typically that's associated, or the research uh, data files or objects that are associated with specific research outputs. And they're not institutionally bound. Clearly, they're based on a particular topic. Though my favorite is Flybase. So anybody who does research with Drosophila or, or flies uh, deposits their research data in Flybase, because that's where your colleagues go. So to my mind, there are a few ways. So both should must coexist because I think there are a lot of people that would be very sad if the institutional memory in terms of the research and scholarly output 
of an institution disappeared because nobody was paying attention to it. But more importantly, I think that those institutional repositories and domain repositories are an integral part of a national approach uh, or national repositories. And the easier, for me, the easiest way to kind of highlight the context is in, as in RDM call two, is with what I call functional layers. So an easy functional layer to think about is discovery. Um, Further has a discovery layer that was, I think, uh, out of UBC's uh, collections discovery layer. Um, it's a great example of a nationally surfacing uh, a portal or service that focuses on the functional layer of discovery. All of the content that it uh, provides access to in terms of metadata is, is from institutional and domain repositories. So neither one of the two really can exist in a long-term context without the other. Because the, the, the wealth that an institutional or domain repository provides surfaces through national and international infrastructure, typically through uh, a functional layer like discovery. Another one that I think a number of people are starting to investigate is storage. So why do we all need to have local storage for what is in essence open content? Clearly if it's secure content that Jeff referred to at the end of his presentation and needs to have some kind of uh, wall around it so not everybody can get access to it, that might require a local piece of infrastructure. Um, but if everything is open, and publicly accessible, why aren't we all just storing all that open data on one big server farm in, I don't know, Europe or Australia or Canada or like it doesn't, to me it doesn't make any sense that that uh, storage thing, which is a very expensive long-term consideration for an institution, uh, doesn't take advantage of what I would call a distributed storage uh, approach. So that's a few comments on the question. Great. Uh, we'll do Jeff and then Alex, if that's okay. Thanks. Um, my thinking on, on this is uh, you could think of repositories as uh, appearing along, along a continuum, but I think that's limiting. So institutional repositories, domain repositories, uh, multidisciplinary national repositories, if you think of them along a continuum, you're, you're limiting the conversation. I think if you think of them more as a matrix, because there is overlap and there's, there's connections and there's, there's connections that if they're there, that's great, and if they're not there, maybe they should be there. So I like to think of it more of a matrix. So for example, if you have a domain repository and it makes sense to have a domain repository, let's use a domain repository. And some have been longstanding and, and serve the community well. If on the other hand, you have a domain collection of, of data that's maybe been sitting in a cobbled together repository, um, as I think is the case in a lot of instances, and they're not very sustainable, they're not financially supported and so on, they're on a grant or something like that, then maybe looking at one of the other repository options, and I'm not suggesting an institutional repository is your best bet, but one example would be, and this is a, a real life example, at, at Queen's University uh, we have a biology station north of Kingston um, that has been operating for 50 years and the current director of that um, is a, a polar researcher but also does work in the context of, of that, uh, that biological field station. His 16 year old son developed a server farm, a raid partition sitting in his office and wrote code to load data into it. And it was there for two or three years, and he came to the library and said, this is, this is what I've got, whatever. For whatever reason, he, he intersected or we intersected with him. The thing about 16-year-olds is they grow up, and they move on. And the code that he wrote was not standards compliant. The, the interface in HTML was, was fine. It did what it did, and you could find the turtle data set, and that was great. But it wasn't sustainable. And so what they did was they said, well, we'll work with the Queen's piece of the Scholars Portal Dataverse, and we'll carve off a piece of that within the Queen's Dataverse and call it the Queen's University Biology Station. And it's branded, and it's got a picture of some 
some particular piece of wildlife, whatever, a snake or a turtle or something, and it's branded and it's there, and that's where their data is sitting, and it's purpose-built in as much as it needs to be. There's nothing terribly funky about this data that requires vast, vast amounts of storage. There's the light just went away. There we go. Um, so that's a, just an example of where we don't need to look at this as sort of a, a continuum of either, you know, it's either either or. I think there are instances where a domain repository makes sense. There are other instances where um, we can work within the context of other repository options in a more of a matrix approach. And there are ways of going out and finding the right repository. And one of the best ways, in my view, is to go and talk to a, your specialist on your campus and find out what they recommend based on what's available um, to serve your purposes. Thanks, Jeff. Um, I think this is an area where it's tempting to think about sometimes we do the wrong things right. And I you can give the right answer to this question, but it's the wrong question. And it, my perspective is the wrong question because most researchers aren't aware, don't care. Um, and I'm going to be uh, the voice of reality in terms of, you know, I see out of an institution every CFI application, I see every CRC application, I see over 100 applications at CHR each year. Can't think of one off the top of my head recently that addressed issues around repositories. Um, so my question back to you, with a professoria who struggle to read emails, have perennial challenges around work-life balance, who time and time again they will say, do not ask us to do one more thing. The right answer here is, well, what can be easiest, what can be most attractive, and what can be most rewarding? And how can we work together to make them really, really authentically and openly care about that? And that, I think, is the right question to ask. Thank you. This is, seems like the next the next best question. Okay, so um, this question is about Indigenous perspectives and or initiatives in the RDM landscape. So um, this is to some extent going to be addressed in the policy, of course. So feel free to talk about that. Um, maybe this time, Jeff, can we start with you? Sure. If, if you recall, at the end of my presentation, the question was, what is the most difficult challenge that we're facing? And I said sensitive data. And then I said, if we looked at that and unpacked sensitive data, we could be here for another day and a half or longer. Um, sensitive data includes the question of how researchers approach indigenous communities and work with them in any kind of a research context. So Portage has a sensitive data working group overarching, but underneath that there are two subgroups, one of which is focused on indigenous data. Um, and we've worked long and hard to try and come up with something uh, to, to actually a, a deliverable, a, an objective, an outcome that we can workshop together and make happen. And so we're in the process of getting a DMP template that will address some of the indigenous uh, communities' interests and concerns or researchers' interests in working with indigenous communities to try and address those as people are going through that planning process. It does speak to what Alex was saying is people don't know, don't care. Well, hopefully the policy will make DMPs a higher priority and then looking for a DMP that would address some of the questions that should be responded to around indigenous data would follow from that. Um, Yeah, I had another thought with this, and it sort of eluded me, so it might come back to me, but um, one of the challenges, I think, in this is, and the biggest challenge with this, is that we can't think of this as a homogenous one thing. We've solved the problem with the indigenous community data. We've written a template, we're done. There is a, a vast heterogeneity out there in the communities, and even within a, a particular group, there may be further subheterogeneity within that group and agreement from one community or another. So um, the example, again, I'll, I'll circle back to um, a biology professor. I come from biology, so anything I talk about is biology. Um, and Mark will possibly do the same because he comes from biology, and Aaron comes from biology, and Shahira comes from biology. So there's a lot of biology folks in this room dealing with this sort of thing. 
but it was an issue where they were going out into communities and they, they wanted to um, study polar bears. And you can't go out and shoot polar bears. And they don't even want you to go out and tranquilize polar bears. They're endangered and so on. So how do you study polar bears? We study polar bears, but how do I say this politely? And you pick up what they leave behind. I think it's termed scat. Whatever's left behind after they've digested what they've, anyway. So they can pick that up and you get an amazing amount of information out of that. But they needed to map out, they needed to get permission from the indigenous communities, the, the information that was gathered about the migration patterns of these, of these, um, these iconic creatures in Canada were very central to the indigenous populations in the north. And for them to go up even collect bear poop, they needed to be working very closely with each individual community through which the, the bear migration patterns were working. So this is not something that is trivial. This is not something that can be dealt with in any one one fell swoop kind of way. Um, so the perspectives are there. It's just they're in that group of challenges. And I'll finish by saying that what we've tried to do with Portage and we're trying to do with these other initiatives is to not forget the challenges, work on the challenges, but at the same time don't get bogged down so that the, the whole enterprise grinds to a halt because we haven't solved these issues. We're still relatively young in this enterprise. We're going to be five or ten years from now. I'm looking forward to looking at all of you younger faces and seeing all of the challenges that you've overcome over the next five to ten years. It'll be just fantastic. So this is one of those challenges. Thanks. Alex? Thanks, Jeff. Um, from an institutional perspective, I think obviously um, this is really important for institutions recognizing our history, recognizing contemporary healthcare challenges and social challenges as well. Um, ongoing challenges around Indigenous involvement. It's um, certainly on many campuses, Indigenous scholars get many, many requests to be involved in things. Um, and, and I would say, you know, don't build a relationship that nanosecond you need something from someone because that doesn't go down well with any of us. Um, start to strengthen those relationships now with your Indigenous scholars, your Indigenous communities, um, and so and think how they can best be involved and engage with moving forward in future. I really echo Jeff's point about um, avoiding you know, anything that looks <coughs> like it's tokenistic. Um, I think true openness is extremely challenging and probably a position of discomfort and you know you're starting to move to a place of openness when you start to feel uncomfortable, things feel out of control. You start to worry about watering down some things, you start to worry about core elements from your perspective of the story that you hold to be most important. Um, but working together with indigenous communities I think requires us all to really authentically have that openness to truly listen. The most underrated leadership skill to truly listen, not when it's easy, but when it's hard, uh, and to work collaboratively. I'm also going to um, ask my colleague, James Doran, who works with me at the University of Alberta, if he's got any perspectives to share, because I think he also has some links um, federally around uh, where this is in terms of the bigger picture around Indigenous populations. Put you on the spot here, James. Thanks, Alex. <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's uh, I, I, very impromptu. Uh, <laughs> there you go, James. It's it's a, it's a it's a huge importance, uh, and I've been doing a very small amount of work, the smallest amount of work in my mind at our institution. My colleague Jeff's with the AUL that I work under and with, um, and we're really fortunate that we do have. You know, we come from the University of Alberta. We have a very large research-intensive institution. Um, we have recently had a signature area, so that's an institutional priority in terms of uh, research called uh, SKIP and it's situating knowledge with Indigenous peoples. We've got um, you know a lot happening and we're able to kind of learn from that and, and grow with it. Um, in my role as putting on my chair, co-chair of the Data Management Planning Esther Group for Portage, I think upstream, I think about data management planning, I think all the things that we can do at the front end, and I think it goes to speak to start now, start early. So thinking about working with our Indigenous communities and working with um, some of the uh, agencies of Canada, like the First Nations Information Government Centre, looking at the principles of OCAP, 
how do we bake these in at the front end and doing that with the stakeholder communities? I think that's you know where you start. And I do agree with some of the comfort level. I, I don't feel a comfort level right now myself personally with tackling indigenous information, indigenous data. And that tells me that I have a lot to learn and I have a lot of work to learn. I think that that's the standard. So getting in now, working hard, and again, I just come back to the data management planning. I work out of libraries, but I don't come from a library's background, I come from a, a research background and being out there in the trenches of research and data and I know that it's a tough, tough go and, and most of us uh, in that realm are working under soft grant funding money, uh, you know, the needs uh, and the priorities are infinite but you're running on finite resources, right? So the more that we can do to help support those researchers, those research programs, uh, by giving them, the, you know, the capacity, and I think that that's a lot of what we're trying to do. That's what Cartage is doing, Research Data Canada is doing. That's what we're trying to do on our own institutional research data management strategies group, of which this is certainly going to be a component. And I agree with, I think what um, what we were saying is learning from our mistakes, right? Like don't going in and, and you're not building something that's bulletproof and expect it to be that. Be able to go out there and then see what works and course correct and 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 kind of move forward more positively and learn from every. So I don't know how much that ex directly uh, answered it, but uh, a little bit of. Thanks, James. Yeah. Thank Mark, you. did you uh, want to comment on this as well? Did you want a question? Yeah, I do. Um, I'll, I'll just shut it out then. Um, I'm kind of surprised nobody's mentioning, it just came out in 2019, the Dimensions, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Canada that's being jointly administered by CIHR, Sure, and that whole group, and it's currently in the pilot phase, but it's the charter that came out is to make, um, drive a deeper cultural change within the research ecosystem. So this is something we should be looking at when we're discussing portage and all these things. Um, in this context, because it's come out of the government and the funding. That's a really good point. And um, it, one of the points I was going to make is uh, working with colleagues at Shirk, for example, on the capacity building grants and other contexts. Um, one thing that's very clear to me is the tri agencies have EDI and indigenous data and research interests at the top of their agenda. Uh, and I see it at all levels from the, uh, the application materials to the review of materials and throughout. So yeah, I would definitely uh, echo a shout out to our, our uh, federal funding colleagues for, for doing a great job in, term, in terms of EDI and Indigenous uh, research interests. Um, I was, uh, two other points I was going to make. Um, show of hands, how many people have heard of the FAIR principles? Yeah, yeah. How many people have heard the phrase, be fair and care? And do you know the organizational context for be fair and care? To put you on the spot? Right. So, uh, from my perspective, <laughs> not distracting at all. No, it's like working from home. Uh, the most important part of the answer to the question to me is the perspective is in individual indigenous communities, and the only way to properly reflect uh, the important considerations that have to go into a new research program all throughout the life cycle is to have a conversation with the community where that research is based or where that research has an impact. And that, of course, is a fundamental concept in the First Nations OCAP principles. Uh, one of the first things I did, I think it was in the second month I start, after I started with RDC, was take the online OCAP uh, course, uh, which I would definitely recommend to everybody. Uh, so the new organization that our colleague refers to is the Global Indigenous Data Alliance, or GIDA. Uh, which just formed uh, a month or two ago. And one of their core uh, efforts is the creation of the CARE principles. So CARE is similar to OCAP. Uh, it's just it's consideration of indigenous communities in an international perspective. And CARE stands for Collective Benefit Authority to Control Responsibility and Ethics. So if you have a, if you're familiar with OCAP, 
and you're familiar with FAIR, then I would take a close look at the, the Be Fair and Care uh, initiative out of uh, GITA and join the GITA list because I think it's an important initiative that is trying to provide the foundational best principles or best practices context which you would then consider when you go in uh, to think about a new research program within a specific uh, Indigenous community in Canada. That's great. Uh, yeah, I'll take an audience question here, please. Uh, it's okay, you can just yell it out. Okay, I'll try to speak louder. Uh, so that was my question. So thank you very much for the, uh, the thoughtful responses, uh, all of you. Um, so I'm with the First Nations Information Governance Center, which was referenced, so thank you for that. And thanks for the reference to, to OCAP. Uh, really just two distinctions I want to make uh, about OCAP is remember that OCAP is by First Nations for First Nations, so we don't claim to speak uh, for uh, Inuit and Métis, so uh, those relationships have to be uh, obviously uh, front and center. The distinctions-based approach, as the current government calls it, um, not to give them too much credit, but uh, that is the best approach. And then the other distinction around OCAP is, um, so the organization uh, FNIGC, we're the stewards of the OCAP principles, and so when you take the course, you learn about what those principles are. Um, and uh, we always need to, even after people take the course, remind them that um, there's a difference between what principles are and how those principles can be expressed uh, you know, on the ground in uh, lived reality. And so in the case of First Nations, it's only rights holding First Nations that can express what OCAP control, uh, ownership control, access and possession really are. So that's the, that's the main distinction. And so that's the level of thinking, at the very least, that institutions and organizations that we partner with, individual First Nations, or however First Nations choose to come together collectively, that's the level of, uh, that's the starting point of, of the conversation. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank I you just, very much. I just wanted to add one other thing um, briefly. And, and um, Mark and Portage and a few others in the community were given the opportunity to look at what we hope is a penultimate version of the RDM policy. And if there's a delta between the policy that we saw prior to that last version we saw and the one we saw, it was uh, a much uh, more frequent uh, appearance of Indigenous data concerns expressed in the policy. It was there throughout the policy in a way that it was there earlier, but it's certainly a, a richer and deeper uh, presence within the policy than it was in the previous version. So I'm expecting that that will survive to the actual policy drop in the new year, and I will not put my colleagues and friends on the, on the spot to actually nod or wink or do something to indicate that in a public forum because we're in the middle of the election period. So great, thanks. Should we do one more question, or do you want to take a break? Yeah, it's three o'clock. Time, time to do yeah. a break. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much to our three panelists.